Hello everybody, James with Love My Pups um, and My Breeder Supply. So I'm going to do a Q&A session. It's been a couple of weeks since I've done one. I apologize about that. So let's get right in it. All right, going back a couple of weeks ago. Um, someone's asking about the swimmer syndrome where you've got these puppies that typically this happens when puppies are about uh, maybe 10 days old. They start swimming around. They don't get, try and get up on their feet at all, which they normally do by three weeks. And what happens is they develop flat chest. And the answer to this is always is to tape up their legs, their back legs. And when you do that, you kind of hobble them. They will get up on their back legs and it will, it will fix this flat chest pretty quickly. They ask, how long does it take? Well, just as long as it takes is how long it takes. You keep on, the tape will come off, other puppies will take the tape off, the mum will take the tape off their legs. Just keep putting it back on until those puppies are standing properly on their two feet and walking around. And once that's going on, you can take it off. So that typically takes three, four, five days, sometimes as much as 10 days. Uh, how long do you feed puppies with a baby bottle? Well, uh, there's two parts to that. One would be how long do you feed a puppy for each session? And the answer to that one is, is that when the puppy's had enough and you've got the, the nipple in its mouth, it'll move its head off to the side and start spitting that thing out it doesn't want it anymore that's a puppy that's had enough or if you start continually seeing milk come out of puppy's nose stop take a paper towel soak that milk up otherwise he can get in his lungs he can get pneumonia so if that's happening number one would be maybe you're feeding too much the other one is maybe if you hold your bottle upside down and, and milk is dripping out that you've got too too big a hole in, in the nipple and it's flowing too freely and according to a an answer I got from last session, there are some preemie nipples that have smaller holes. Maybe you should try and find one of those or go get yourself another nipple. And then how long do you feed milk for? Well, as long as they need it. If they're under three weeks old, they need milk uh, and they need to have little fat bellies. And if they're not getting that from mum, you're going to have to provide it. Always goat's milk or, or puppy milk replacer. Never cow's milk. Never cow's milk. Cow's milk give them diarrhea, not my cow's milk. Do the puppy stay in the incubator the whole time while not feeding and for how long? This is my first litter, that's Shauna. No Shauna, what I do is I leave, well, you, you know, you need to go look at my whelping systems where this idea where you have the heat underneath the pig rail, that's a very, very safe environment for puppies. I do not take my puppies away from mum. I think that gives mum's anxiety. I leave my puppies with mum 24 seven for as long as mum will put up with them. That might be eight weeks. So I do not keep them away. The only time that I put puppies in the incubator is if I'm going to and from the vet, or I've got a sick puppy, or I've got problems with puppies, or mum needs a little rest for a little bit. Otherwise, they're in with mum all the time. Uh, looking for a good breeder. Well, that's us. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Lena says, most of these colors do not occur naturally in the breed, the color genetic of mutts. Well, Lena, I would say go look at my latest video I did last night that talks specifically about this and why there's this, where you're part of that misconception about what you think these colors are. So learn from my video, please, and then make a comment and let's see whether you agree because what you said there really is not right. Don't mean to be mean. Just want to be truthful. Uh, what is the best microscope you'd recommend? I did a, I did a video on microscopes. Well... If you're buying a new one, they're going to be expensive. Go look on Amazon and look for one with good reviews. Make sure it's a binocular, has two eyepieces, it's so much better. Get one that has up to a 400 power. You don't need, a, you don't need this 1,000, 1,200 power microscope. You'll never use it. If you're going to go get a used one on eBay, then go with a good name like Fisher Scientific, um, Bausch & Long. You know, that ones that you see a lot of, those are ones that are quality microscopes. Uh, Oh, and one thing on that, be careful because there are some microscopes you see on eBay and therefore what are called wide field microscopes for looking at things in a big area like working on printed circuit boards. They don't have a magnification beyond about 10 or 20. You don't want that. You've got to have a magnification. You'll be using a magnification of something between 50 and 100 is what you'll use mostly. You want to have at least 100 magnification. Uh... I've heard breeders say they take no shortcuts. Do you know what they mean? They go straight from A to B and they don't wander around. I don't know what that means. I think what they're meaning is they do it right. And you know, again, that's just a 
salesman term, I think. I no, if you do it right, there's so many things that you can do to get it wrong. Uh, I zero says I've seen a pup that was a blue or lilac couldn't tell with a black face not an entire black mask what is the name called for this color and how do you get it well golly I mean there's not enough information there to tell me what that is but I can tell you this a lilac puppy will breed little d will come back from the genetic test as little d little d blue and depending on whether it's testable or not it is got to be a chocolate, little, big B, big, little B, little B. And this has the red eye glow. So red eye glow, when you take, not as a picture, not as a photograph, red eye glow, but as a low, go into a dark room with your phone and take a video with a light on and you'll have a demonic red eye glow. That is the definitive test for that. That is a lilac dog. If it has that, it's lilac. By the way, if it's little E, little E, it's cream. Don't see any of this stuff because cream's like white paint that covers everything up, and that's a platinum. And if it's this, it doesn't test DD, it's cream and has red eye glow, it's a champagne. That's a champagne. All right. Uh, I love your videos. This is John May. Uh, would you recommend the Draminsky ovulation detector? No, would not. So the Draminsky, let's just talk about that, I'm not talking about more. The Draminsky is kind of a handheld little instrument. <clears throat> it's about this physical size. It has a square thing on it. And it has a probe that comes out on the end with a kind of a chrome tip to it. And it's got a display on there and a couple of buttons. <clears throat> what you do is, is you loop this thing up and you stick it up inside the, the uh, um, dog's vulva. And this thing measures the resistance of the mucus inside the vulva, and it comes up with a reading on this display. And you, you, you then plot every day you do this, and you do a plot of days versus the readings. And you're looking for, I don't remember if it's a dip or it's a rise, but anyway, you're looking for an anomaly. Slowly it rises up, and then all of a sudden you get a dip, or, or maybe it's a rise again. It's been a long time since I've used one. And from that, you can try to predict ovulation. Um, I've used them. Uh, I used to have one. I sold it. Uh, I found it to be um, somewhat reliable, but not reliable enough to be of any value to me. So the problem was is I got too many false readings. And from that, I could not, and I was doing proper lab tests to compare it. And based on that, I, I just could not rely on the thing. It'd be right, you know, 80% of the time maybe, but that's not good enough. 80% doesn't get it. All right. Um, so no, I don't, the risk is like three, four, five hundred bucks. I wouldn't buy one. Uh... Okay, I already answered that one. Um, if, I want to ask, this is James Palmer, I want to ask um, if it's helpful to, to give calcium lactate. Um, so I th this is on the third week from the time she, this, the AI happened. Well, I think you're a little early on that. I mean, you've got to worry about... So the problem, the, the, what they're giving the calcium lactate for is, is that you can get a thing called milk eclampsia, where there's too much calcium being drawn out of the dog because of all the milk it's producing. And that can produce a calcium deficiency. And that can be a real problem where the dog, you know, can, can go into convulsions, can get sick. It's called milk fever. But none of that's going to happen until puppies are starting to drain milk from her. So I don't think there's much pipe point starting with calcium lactate, if that even works, until you're maybe a week prior to whelp. Certainly, it is not something that you should be doing you know, when you're a month and a half away from whelp, because again, none of the calcium is being pulled out of the dog until the puppies are born. So what we do is we, we put things like cottage cheese uh, on her food to give her extra, extra calcium intake, and uh, you know, or goat's milk, powdered goat's milk, put that on her food, you know, a week prior to whelp and start doing that. And I don't know whether that calcium really gets into her system or not. So I, it may be just uh, wishful thinking, but that's what we do. Uh, uh, KDC Cannell says, hey, quick question. I have a female cream French bulldog. I'm planning to pair it with a male black and tan. What puppies will they produce? Okay. So don't have enough information here to answer this properly, but all we know is, is the female is a cream, which is EE. -E. And remember, a cream dog, everything else about that dog, whether it's got 
Um, tan points, blue, chocolate, brittle is covered up by the cream. Cream is like white paint, it covers everything up. So if you tell me that you've got a cream dog, all I know is it's EE, -E. right. Uh, with a black and tan. Okay, so what's the black and tan? The black and tan is probably double A recessive, which makes for a black dog. Uh, actually, it's probably, sorry, it's tan points. So it's probably, it's, pro it's got to be, um, it's not cream. <clears throat> it's not, it's not blue. <clears throat> it's not chocolate, because it's a black. <clears throat> and since it's got tan points, it doesn't have, I'm going to call it KM, doesn't have brindle, that's great. Um, and it's black and tan, so it's probably ATA, but it might be something different in terms of tan points. So what happens if you pair those dogs together? Well, all I can tell you is, is that you get dogs that aren't cream that are cream carriers. And we don't know about anything else. So unfortunately, I can't answer any more than tell you that you're going to get a dog that's a cream carrier. And in terms of physically, what else, we, what else the dog is, we can't answer the question. So, so there's an example there that uh, you've got to give me some more genetic information if you want an answer from me. Without that, it's very difficult. And if you can tell me something about the parents, what color the parents were, that can be normally be, that is always helpful. Uh, what? Oh, someone's asking about the fluffy I had last time. Where does the long hair come from? Well, go look at my latest video that I did on exotic colors on, on Frenchies, and it will answer that question. I did a surgical on day 25 and got 11 puppies. Uh, North Las Vegas said that. Well, good for you. Right, so surgical. Surgical is very useful if you're in a situation where you're late on breeding and your progesterone numbers are high, like 20 and above. Normally, that might be a bit late to breed vaginally, but not late to breed surgically. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, it takes about one day for the semen to take that trek up the vaginal canal through the cervix and into the uterus. And if you do a surgical AI, a cut is made in the belly, the principal looks put, put under for a little bit, five, 10 minutes, make a cut in the belly, take the horns out of the um, uh, uterus and inject the semen directly into it. So you short circuit that trip that would normally take a day. So you gain a day. And so she got a nice litter of puppies and if she hadn't have done a surgical, she probably wouldn't have done. I have a black, I have a female, this is Joanne David. I have a female mural black, yellow background with black spots and wants a parrot with a lilac. What babies can I get? Well, all I can tell you is, I don't know enough about the genetics on this girl to tell you what you're gonna get. Other than, we do know this, that that dog has got one copy of Merle, <clears throat> and the dog that she's breeding to does not. And so consequently, if you do a Punnett square on, and, and Merle's, and I'm gonna answer another question that came up at the same time, and that was, what colors are not recessive in that, that what they mean by that is a single gene will express itself. And the answer to that is there's two things that do that, brindles and Merle's. You only need a single copy for it to show. A single copy of Merle, it's a Merle dog. <clears throat> a single copy of Brindle, it'll show Brindle. A double copy of Merle, by the way, is very bad news. That ends up with dogs that have all kinds of problems. So you never, never, never breed Merles to Merles. So let's take this example here. We've got one dog that is the Merle, Merle, Merle carrier, which shows as Merle, and one dog that is not. And let's get that off the top. So these are capital M's on the top that are non-Merle and a small M and a big M on the bottom. So what do we get? We get this, that is a Merle dog. And we get this, that is a Merle dog. And then these bottom on the Punnett square, remember we take this and this to get that, this and this to get that, this and this to get that. So this and this gets this block right here. There we have it. Half the dogs are not Merle, and half the dogs are Merle. So you get a litter of half murals. Not, I mean, it's not exact, don't get me wrong here. This is a statistical thing, like how many boys and girls would you get in a litter? Typically 50-50 of both, same thing here. So, um, and while we're here, let's just talk about what, why you don't breed a mural to a mural. And the answer to that one is, so we'll get rid of these. <clears throat> and now we'll make this a little bit M here. So we've got a mural dog, remember that's one copy of mural to one copy of mural. Right. And this is the capital M and the small M. So what do we get? We get 
and Merle, great, they're doing good. Here's the problem, little M, little M, there's the problem. And here we get M, M, not Merle, and here we get the Merle dog. So, this and this, <coughs> this and this, great, those are Merle dogs. This is a non-Merle, it's good. Here's the problem, and two little M's. That dog's gonna have all kinds of hell in life. Blindness, deafness, whatever else. I don't know, never done it, so I don't know exactly how terrible it is, but you just, I can tell you this, you just don't do it. So the danger is one quarter of the litter are double merles, and those dogs have a problem. That's why you never put a merle for the merle. Okay. Uh, someone's saying thank you for the thing on prolapse, they fixed their dog, good for you. Can you do a video on what you do with the mum when she gives birth? Well, we wrap ours up in bacon and cook them and put them in the oven and eat them. No, we don't. Don't give me a response to that, please. Well, once they've had their puppies, what we do is we put, well, what would, I mean, as, as the women out there watching this who've had babies, um, you know, how do you feel if somebody came and took your baby away from you and gave it to you for, you know, maybe you know half an hour every three hours i mean you wouldn't like it i mean you would not like it at all and why do you think that a french bulldog or any other dog would be any different that there are some reasons why you can't sometimes put babies with mums because there's problems with the health of either the mum or the babies i understand that but dogs that have had a c-section they bounce back within hours of not seeming like they've had any kind of surgery and they want to be with their babies and they should be with their babies and you want to, especially right at the beginning, instill this bond between mother and babies. And so we put our mums with their babies until they've had enough of it. And that might be at eight, nine weeks old. It might be at, uh, at five or six weeks old when we start weaning. But we put mum with her babies as long as she wants to be with her babies. We do monitor it carefully for the first half a day to make sure there's no you know, especially on new moms never had babies before to make sure there's nothing going wrong. And it's not like that can't happen. There's another video in here, another question here about somebody who had had a C-section of the vets and then they left the, right after the C-section, they left the baby and the vet uh, and the mum together uh, with nobody around at all and she killed all the babies. So that's a terrible day and somebody really was delinquent on that in my opinion. I mean, you just, you you You've, especially when they've just had a C-section and have just come out of anesthesia, they're very groggy. And we do put our babies with mum with a towel over them to get them to nurse right away. But we are right there stroking mum's head, talking to her. You know, she knows our voice, making her aware of what the situation is. So monitor it. But the answer is we leave our mums with their babies for as long as she will put up with it. Uh... What color dogs do you need to, to get Merle puppies? Well, it's back to the other video. You've got to have one parent, only one has to have a copy of Merle and be a Merle dog. If you've got that, you'll get Merles. If you don't have one of the parents as a Merle, you're not going to get any Merles. Uh, experimenting on myself. Uh, this is an interesting one. I was talking about mastitis. Uh, this, is, this is a good one. Joseph uh, says, uh, I made a poultice out of grated raw turmeric uh, I kept it on a, an infected finger overnight using the tip of a plastic glove. In the morning, the infection was drawn out. Uh, I tried doing the same thing. Uh, uh, she had a secondary burn, and the, she used it with garlic, and it made the skin peel off. So the tumor, I've heard about this before, raw, raw turmeric as being something that's good for, you make kind of a poultice out of it. And we were talking about mastitis with a dog that's got an infection going on from a, a mammary gland that's got blocked, and then it's got septic. And so I mentioned about cabbage leaves. I've read about people putting cabbage leaves on to help draw it out. Uh, and and this, he's saying turmeric. I mean, I, I'd say I'd give it a shot. The challenge is always to make it stay on there without the dog licking it off and getting sick maybe. Uh, or, uh, uh, you know, how do you make it stay on there? You have to put some kind of a back patch all the way around it. But an interesting idea. Uh, why don't you use the natural way to procreate instead of doing the AI? So this is uh, uh, Leah Caswell. Well, the reason is in French is, is that they have a very hard time hooking up 
And uh, typically what happens is you exhaust the male, he doesn't get the job done, and he ends up ejaculating on the ground, and then you've missed your opportunity to, to uh, you can't wait till the next day until he's kind of reloaded to do it again. So we do AIs on all French Bulldogs here. I have a brindle pied male. Both of his parents are pieds. So here's a good one. Someone's giving me some information here. Good for you. This is a uh, solo boss nation. Got a brindle pied male. So we know he's SS for pied. Has to have two copies to show it. And by the way, we, we could have guessed that because he had brindle, he had pied parents. And he is, he is brindle. So he's KB. Probably one copy, we'll call it KN. Uh, and her, okay. And, uh, okay, and he also says her mother, um, my female is, sorry, I have a brindle pied male. Both the parents are pied. My female is a brindle, uh, brindle, her mother is a queen. Okay, so here's the brindle, this is the other dog. So we've got one copy of Brindle. Um, her mother is Cream. Since her mother is Cream, she had to have inherited a copy of Cream from Mum. And her father is Merle with tan points. So we'll assume that, she, that this dog got a copy of tan points from Dad, so A-T-A-Y. But just because the parent is Brindle, if, you, uh, if this dog is not Brindle, it did not get the Brindle gene. So now the question is, what do we get out of this? Well, we know that we're going to get a combination of dogs that are KBKN, not Brindle, and KNKN. So we'd expect to get half the dogs Brindle, half the dogs not Brindle. Um, half the dogs will carry cream. So half the dogs will be EE -E, and half the dogs will be E carry cream. <coughs> I'm assuming this is an AYAY -A -Y dog because we haven't been told otherwise. So half the dogs get to be A-T-A-Y, carry a copy of 10 points. The other half don't have anything to do with 10 points. We know that, if you can see this. Uh, and then we don't know whether the other dog carries a copy of Pied or not. If it carries a copy of Pied, then half the dogs will be S-S, S-S, and half the dogs will be s not, and there's so half will be Pied and half won't. So we don't really know too much, unfortunately, other than the fact you're gonna get some brindling in here. So I suspect that what you'll get will be a litter of, and we're not being told anything about other colors like blue or chocolate. So I think that what you're gonna get here are gonna be half brindles and half fawns. And if the other dog carries a copy of pied, if it carries one copy of pied, then you will get half pieds and half not pieds. Not really useful, but at least a starting point to guess on what we're going to get. Somebody sent me something in Spanish. Sorry, I did too lazy to translate. Cobby is spelled with two Bs. Correct. My wife corrected me on that. I put a video together on my Meryl boy, and I put Cobby as K-O-B-Y, Kobe, which I guess is the kind of beef that you eat, so I got that wrong. Someone's asking, is it really 60 days ahead of time? Hmm. I think what they're, they're talking about my C-section, and I said don't be early. The answer is it's 61 days if you did the AI correctly. It's 63 days from ovulation. And all that does is give you a window of potentially when she needs to be C-section. So it's not a scheduling event, it's a window. We have my first litter. Uh, this is, um, somebody already asked me another question before. Kahuna, or blah, blah, blah. Um, umbilical cords. Oh, good one, yes. So they're asking about the umbilical cords and hemostats. And about, okay, so what we're talking about here is, and this is an interesting one. Um, so a puppy's born, and so I'm gonna do a terrible picture of a puppy, but here's the puppy, all right? A little tail right there. And it is attached with an umbilical cord to this placenta. And this placenta, this is what you're keeping. That's the puppy, my terrible drawing. That's what you're keeping and that's what you're getting rid of. And so there's a blood supply through this placenta to the dog. And you can't just whack it off because the dog will start bleeding and get infection through the umbilical cord. So what do you do? So the answer is, is that most vets will put a hemostat on here because it's quick. 
So they'll put a hemostat on here and that blocks the hemostat are, uh, I don't think I've got one in here, but hemostats are, you know, like uh, surgical uh, pliers, I call them that. All right, needle nose pliers. They put a hemostat on here and uh, there's the hemostat <clears throat> and that blocks off the flow. And then they'll put, uh, they'll take some, uh, I use dental floss, but you know, you take some thin cord stitch material and you tie off right here close to the belly uh, so that you can then cut this and you can separate the placenta from, from, the, from the baby. And most of the times the vet will leave this hemostat on here. And I don't like that because you've now got a puppy with, uh, with a hemostat on its belly and you're shaking that puppy around trying to get fluid out and that hemostat's bouncing around. And you can cause an umbilical hernia. You can herniate this region right there. I like to get rid of this thing as quick as possible. I like to just leave with just a umbilical cord, a little bit of umbilical cord, maybe half an inch of umbilical cord, with it tied off close to the belly. I mean, within about maybe a quarter of an inch of the belly. That's how I like to leave it, because now I can be rough and tumble with this puppy, vigorously shake it around, and not worry about this heavy hemostat pulling on the umbilical cord. All right, so the next question is, what happens if you herniate it? Well, you may have to have surgery. So what we talk about when it herniates is, is that the, 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 the wall here where the umbilical cord is, is supposed to end up in being a belly button. And if you have a tear in it, then the part of the guts can pooch out through that hole. You won't see the guts themselves because there's a membrane in there. But basically, part of the guts can come up through that hole and it can herniate it, meaning it clamps it down. And that can be a disaster. Now, you can do repairs on this. You can put a stitch in it. But, and it's not, um, um, umbilical hernias are not hereditary conditions that you have to worry about not breeding the dog. Inguinal hernias, which is a completely different thing, is where you have a puppy where, where the legs, <clears throat> again, lousy pictures, sorry about this, I'm just not an artist. <clears throat> These are the legs, here's the belly button. So the umbilical hernia, we're talking about a tear around where the belly button is. So there's a blood supply that goes down through, and that pen doesn't work, so we'll have to do bloody green. There's a blood supply that goes down through its ephemeral artery on both legs, and it goes through a small hole <clears throat> that separates the abdomen cavity. There's a little hole here that it passes through. And what can happen is, is that you can get a hernia that develops in this area right here. And that is something that could well be a hereditary condition. So typically, we do not breed dogs with inguinal hernias. Um, they can fix themselves. You can push them back a bit. The way you can tell, by the way, if a puppy, when you're getting a puppy, if it has an inguinal hernia, is what you do is you hold the puppy up so it's facing you, heads up here, legs dangling down, and you just bounce it up and down a little bit. And what you'll see is a little fat pooch coming out. Actually, it's part of the intestines pooching out through this little area right here, right in the groin, left and right side. It's on both sides. It's called a bilateral inguinal hernia. One side is just an inguinal hernia. So you'll, what you can do is you can then press that little area that it may be fat deposits, that's not a problem. But if you can push it back in and it disappears and you bounce the puppy again and it pops out again, that is an inguinal hernia. And that is something you don't want. It's fixable and have, the puppy can have a completely normal life, but you definitely do not want to be breeding that dog. That dog needs to be spayed. Okay. So I've had puppies that I've received with inguinal hernias and it's upsetting because I asked specifically Please make sure the vet checks for an inguinal hernia. The dog shows up with an inguinal hernia and I'm upset. Uh, are progesterone tests mandatory uh, for, for timing the AI? Well, the answer to this is no, they are not. But it is one more piece of information that lets you breed or C-section a dog correctly. So. Uh, I always advise people to get progesterone levels before we do an AI um, and not just do it off things like behavior and color of blood uh, and, and the amount of swelling and the number of days. It can be done that way, but it's much more reliable to get a progesterone test. And then as far as the other end, deciding when to do the C-section, if you can get a progesterone level and you're doing a C-section with a level of two or less, you're safe.
sorry. Uh, is it okay to deposit the... Uh, we're talking here about ch uh, ch what I send, which is chilled semen. I send it to my customers in my shipping blast called Shipmate, and they want to know if they have to do anything to it when it gets there. And the answer is no. You just open up the thing, open up the container, get your AI rod onto your syringe, suck the semen out of a little world pack bag, and go ahead and immediately disseminate your dog. You do not have to warm it up. It'll warm up within a few minutes anyway, just being outside the container. It's the other end of it. What I do when I'm shipping it that's important. You have to cool it down very slowly over about a four hour period to get from the dog's temperature of maybe 100 degrees Fahrenheit down to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And you have to get that done over about a four hour period. So that part got to be done slowly, otherwise you get what's called cold shock. The other way end warming up is not important at all. Someone talking about umbilical cord has already answered that. Where can I get the serum to separate the blood at? Well, I think you. This is Flaco ninety four. Flaco ninety four. I think you're a bit confused here. So what we do is we're talking about doing progesterone tests or other tests. Um, what? Well, maybe not talking about that. Yes, we are because it's talking about progesterone testing. So what we do is we draw blood from the dog, and I draw typically about one mil, not very much. And then I take the cap that goes on the needle on the uh, um, guard cap, goes on the, the end of the needle to protect you from getting hurt. There's the little guard cap that's blown up like crazy. There's a guard cap. And then I put the blood in that, and that about fills it up. And then I put that in a centrifuge. And when I do that, what I end up with, when it's all centrifuged out after about five minutes, is I end up with a clot of dark red blood on the bottom and some clear liquid on the top. And that is the serum or plasma that we're going to use, actually the plasma, There's, that, that's what we are going to use for our testing is that. Uh, if you don't have a centrifuge, you can put this on the end of a ceiling fan, turn your ceiling fan on for about an hour and it will get the same result. So I think that that's what they're asking about. So the answer is you've got to centrifuge it to separate out the clear liquid from the blood cells. And you're going to use the clear liquid for any test that you're doing. How do I find the cutout of my French Bulldog? So people are under the misconception that they're going to get their breeder report back, their breed certificate, and, and lots of these dogs are DNA. They have to be DNA'd because maybe their imported dogs have to be DNA'd by the AKC. You have to send off uh, either a cheek swab, a blood, uh, or a, you know, dew claws, and they will do a DNA test on the dog to make sure that it is part of the Frenchie empire, that it's a purebred Frenchie. Um, they, it's, it's very, basically what they're doing is they are tracking lineage to make sure that it comes back from a lineage of other French Bulldogs and we're not cheating. Um, but it's got nothing to do with coat colour or anything else. So the DNA report that you get back from the AKC has got nothing to do with, they've got no information in there that you're going to use for anything other than parentage. You can get the DNAs done by the AKC and you can pay 40 bucks and have it done but what you're going to get back is a string of numbers and then you'll get some panels with some letters in it and it typically and i wish i had one i'd just show you because i'm going to get this wrong but basically you'll have some panels that look like this <clears throat> and probably like eight of them and they'll have some numbers in them i think it's numbers like you know, 9 15 might be a and c d and e three and six so what you, these are um, parts of the gene, parts of the genetics of that dog. And if you've got another dog that came from that dog, here's the puppy. So this is <clears throat> okay. This is this is mum. This is called this mother. This is the puppy that we're looking at. And this is dad down here. So you get this genetic report back. <clears throat> and this dog is obviously a different dog, so it's got different things in here. Right. 
random set of numbers in this, random set. So this puppy, this box right here, this puppy has to have got one of these squares and one of these squares. So here's an example, nine and, and uh, nine from that dog and six from that dog. Now, same thing again, it's got to get one of these from this. It got the A from this dog and it got the C from this dog. And it has to again, get one of these letters to get this. So it got the E from the, from the dad and it got the E from the mum. And it has to get, same thing again, so it's got to match up, so we'll give it a four and a six, and we'll give it an H and a K. Right, that dog, we can look at that and we can say in all probability that that puppy came from those two parents based on the AKC's DNA report. It has nothing to do with color, nothing to do with whether it's got brindle or whether it's piebald or merled. It's just a parentage thing. And if you look at this, if you get these reports back and you've got a parentage of a puppy, you can look and see, and it has to match up. Every one of these squares has to match up with either mum or the dad. If this one matched up to the mum, the other one's got to match up to that. You've got to have that. If you don't have that, that puppy did not come from those parents. It has to match. Every square has to make some sense. And so by the time you've got like six or eight squares together and they all make sense, it almost certainly has to have come from that dog. All right, I spent a bit of time on that. But it's kind of an interesting one. I've been in that situation before where there have been parentage questions. And you can send the information off to the AKC, and after about a month, they'll give you the answer. But you can figure it out yourself. You can just figure it out in minutes if, they, if, they'll give, if you ask for the DNA test. Uh... Oh, I actually love your videos. Victoria Pugh. Are Chow Chow Color Genetics presented the same way? Yes, probably. Uh... So how does it work when people say their dogs can produce many different colors? Uh, well, what they're talking about is you've got people who say, my dog's a quad carrier or a tri carrier. What are they talking about? What they're talking about is, is things like cream that are not expressed, the dog can be a carrier of. It's always the small letter. Dogs that are not blue, but can produce blue puppies, they have the one gene for the blue. Dogs that are chocolate, have uh, carriers have one copy for the uh, for the blue um, dogs that can carry tan points have one copy of the tan point gene that's what we're talking about so so the so the answer to this is that dog can produce although it may just be a straight fawn dog or if it had a copy of brindle a brindle dog it can produce creams blues chocolates, 10 point dogs, if it's put with a dog that has a corresponding, now if you put it with a dog like this, so it'd be a platinum dog, if you put that together, what would you get? Well, half the dogs would be blue and half the dogs would be blue carriers, half the dogs would be cream, half the dogs would be cream carriers, half the dogs would be chocolate and half the dogs would be chocolate carriers. That's what you get out of it. When you mix that all together, there's a lot of variations of what you can get. So I hope that answers the question. It's uh, kind of a fairly complicated, if I'm going to give you a really in-depth answer, it's going to take half an hour. But that's just a quick answer to that one. Uh, let's stop my other one. Last one here. Uh, do you know of any lethal genes in Frenchies? Lethal well, yeah, I don't know. There's no test for them that I know of. Um, you know, there are some, ge there's some health test panels that we do for Frenchies. There's a four-panel health test, which I think is pretty much a bunch of bunk. I had a video on DM. Um, where I think it's, I know it's just rubbish. So the answer is, I, you know, there's, there's lethal genes and all, all kinds of lethal genes out there that are lethal for human beings in our population, lethal to dogs in theirs, but we don't have tests for them and we just don't know what they are. So the answer to that is, is yeah, you bet they're out there. Um, certain common, most of, the, all of these are going to be double recessive. You have, they're fairly rare. Both parents have to have them. And in those situations, I'll do a Punnett square here. In those situations where you have these bad genes, all good genes, that they are recessive. So we're going to talk about a good gene and then, well, no, we'll do it this way. Someone has got a really bad gene. We're going to call it B. And they've got one copy of it. There it is. And if that is put with a dog that does not have a bad gene, they're all the, the good versions of it, then every dog is going to be okay. Half the dogs will carry the lethal gene, but they will not express it. They will not have it. Um, if we go in a situation where we're in the unfortunate situation where <clears throat> the, uh, both parents have a copy of the lethal gene, 
then we get, again, we're okay here, we just carry it, but here's the problem. One quarter, one in four of the dogs get this lethal gene. There's the problem. So if you see a situation where you, know, you have a disaster and, and you had a big litter and one quarter of the litter had the problem, it's probably a double recessive problem. And it, it may be one of those genes that's present. So what do you do about it? Well, you don't breed those dogs together again. So my advice to people generally is, if you have a problem with the breeding between dogs that have had other puppies before without any problems, but those two puppies, one quarter of the litter or something close to it has some terrible situation, do not breed those two dogs together. You repeat things that are successful and you stop doing things that aren't successful. It's true of everything and it's absolutely true of this. Hey, appreciate you watching my videos. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe to me. If we've got things wrong, absolutely let us know. If you've got other things that you think we should talk about, let us know about that. And we really appreciate you watching our videos. And uh, you know the important thing is, look after your doggies. Bye everybody.